My name is Theophile Chenevere. I was born in Detroit, 1945. I first attended St. M in 1960, and I graduated in the class of 1964. Being back here, how do you feel? What is your mission? What is your purpose? How are you still connected to this school after all this time? It's more than an emotional connection. It's more of a spiritual connection now. My youth, my adolescence, it's still here. So when I return to this land, it's not only a rejuvenation of life and energy, but I'm young again. I can still see me as that young kid enjoying and even disliking the discipline and all the personalities that we were about. Okay. We're here today to give a voice to those who preceded us, to tell the story of the land and our antecedents. This property, a magnificent piece of property, had been shared simultaneously by the richest people in this country and also the poorest or disenfranchised. And I think it is essential that the story be told in one instance that anything like slavery would never happen again and the other that the children of slaves had an opportunity to better their lives and better the lives for their children. And it's certainly laced with exciting events and vivid, colorful history. Our purpose is to tie it together to tell the story in chronological order. And it's amazing the events that took place, the transformation from the political arena to the academic arena to our everyday lives, the lives that we enjoy today. St. Emma and St. Francis, they were put together as boarding schools and used this property to isolate us from the complexities of the socio-economic political air in the South. And from the isolation, this insulated us. We had no part of it. When we arrived, we arrived by train and immediately would board buses. So we never really, like kids, never really had an opportunity to feel what Jim Crow meant in the South. And it was set up that way. Our buses arrived on campus. We, um, say, embarked on a whole nother life. We never really saw the outside world when we attended school here. And this was good. The land here at St. Emma comprises approximately 2,700 acres. Out of this 2,700 acres, there were a conglomerate of approximately six farms. Eventually, these six farms became Bellmead Plantation. These lands were part of the English land grant system. And the grants were handed out by a king that never even saw it. One of the owners, 
a man named Dr. Logan. He came from Stanton, Pennsylvania. His father, and they say he was the direct offspring of James Logan, who came over with William Penn on William Penn's second voyage to the Americas. James Logan was the governor of Pennsylvania. He also oversaw the colony. He amassed a fortune trading with the Indians, and he traded in furs and iron ore, and he's very well known today. He dabbled in astronomy, and he was also the father of hybrid corn, which would lead one to believe that he enjoyed farming, and he passed it on to his heir in Dr. Logan. Dr. Logan acquired uh, a few of these acres, and upon his death, it was writ written in his will to free the slaves in his possession. That started a lengthy court battle, and his wife, uh, Mary Pleasance, she was of a family of Virginia heritage that wielded a lot of power. So they fought her in court over the decision that was made to free these slaves. She eventually won, and Dr. Logan's request was eventually honored. There was another young man who graduated from West Point with honors. His name was Philip St. George Coke. Although this day and age, the name is pronounced Cook. His family came from Bremo Bluff, Virginia, which is a few miles from this place. But upon his graduation, he crossed the James River and came upon, upon this property and found that it was for sale. And it was such a nice piece of land that he thought he'd like to own it. He ended up purchasing, purchasing a small amount of land, but then eventually purchased, purchased more acreage to create the Bell Mead that we have today. He became one of the richest planters in America. He was into irrigation and into crop rotation and he wanted to start an agricultural school. He was a visionary. And from the time before John Brown's raid to just before the beginning of the Civil War, he began to outfit a troop, a Powhatan troop. He supplied that troop with horses, uniforms, and weaponry so that when Lee and Jefferson Davis called him to Richmond, he was prepared. They gave him a generalship. They made him the general of the Provisional Army of Alexandria. And he promptly went out and won the very first battle of the Civil War which was the first battle of Manassas. On his return, he was demoted to colonel. His Powhatan troop given to Beauregard, and Beauregard made that troop his personal honor guard. Coke, dejected, retired himself to this property, and a few days later, went into the library, put a gun to his head, and killed himself, supposedly, while overlooking the James River. Within the next 29 years, from reparations of the war for the lack of economy in the South, the Cook family eventually lost their holdings here. In 1892, Edward Deval Morrell, who became an eventual Pennsylvania congressman, and his wife, Louise Drexel Morrell, 
purchased the property on which we sit today. They had been believers in the education of the poor. In their travels in Europe and Germany, they saw the way boarding schools were put together and how they were run. They also had followed some of the readings of Booker T. Washington and felt the need to educate the southern black male. And the agreement was to educate that southern black male in what they knew best, which was agriculture and industry. What is also interesting to note, when you think of the beginning of this school, the very first student to attend the girls' school was a Native American girl from Wyoming. Now, the boys' school, property purchased in 1892, school opened its doors in 1895, was up and running. St. Catherine Drexel, related to her sister Louise, had done missionary work in Virginia. And in doing so, she was very close to the bishop in the region and a lot of uh, the clergy. And she had occasion to visit the property and found that there were 700 acres on the other side of Deep Creek, which is a creek that runs between the girls' school and the boys' school. She purchased that property and erected the girls' school on the other side, named after her father, Francis Drexel. Both schools instituted an academic program, and this program was orchestrated or produced by Drexel University, a school which her father started. St. Emma was named after Louise and St. Catherine's mother, Emma Bouvier Drexel. In the ensuing years, there had been certain buildings erected and certain structures that gave honor for them to have created such fine institutions for us. My name is Angela McDaniel Gerald. I graduated St. Francis de Sales High School in the class of 1964. Uh, together with Pete Shenevert, uh, we have formed a corporation, the Book and Candle Research and Development Corporation, through the auspices of which we hope to bring life back to this place that we dearly love. Uh, when I drove in to the property today, I had a feeling that it's hard to explain, a calm, at the same time I was excited, happy to be back again, even though it's been only a couple of months since I was here last. I love visiting here. In fact, I wish I'd never have to leave again. Uh, the years that I spent here, those four years were, I can say, without Well, I just know they were the best years of my life. Without reservation, I know that they were the best years of my life. The organization that we formed, we intend to extend membership to anyone who ever attended St. Francis de Sales or St. Emma Military Academy. And it is our hope that we would bring a knowledge of these two institutions and what they gave to us and what they mean still to us, uh, to the public at large, because there are masses of people who never knew these two institutions ever existed. And I believe that 
the country and the world needs to know, needs to know that they existed, what still exists on this property and what it did for us, what it meant to us. And we hope to bring that to fruition uh, through the auspices of Booking Candle Research and Development Corporation. We have done a great deal of research uh, in conjunction with several of the alumni of St. Emma who live in the area in Richmond. Uh, they've done massive research as a matter of fact and been able to accumulate a lot of information, a lot of photographs, old photographs and in fact um, graduates, older graduates of the schools who are very interested in what has become and what may become of this property. Um, it's a property that, that I think most of us have the interest in. Uh, there are lots of things that have been mentioned with regard to possibilities as to what could be done up here. Uh, mainly we're interested in some type of museum where we can uh, display the artifacts and memorabilia from the years that we spent at this school and um, hopefully establish a tourist location here where um, students, former students, former graduates, their families, friends can come up to this property, visit at any time that they'd like to and enjoy what we enjoy when we, when we come here. The serenity, it's just, it, it's something you can hardly explain. Uh, visiting the old slave cemeteries and that. There's so much rich history here. And uh, there are a number of us who really thrive in it all. Um, I am planning to enjoy this day and this weekend here. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to accomplish something that'll be forever in the annals of the annals of Virginia history and our own. We, uh, well, the guys and, and, and the girls from St. Francis, we walked this hill on numerous occasions. Uh, any social functions that were held on either campus, either uh, the guys would march over to St. Francis or we would walk over here. That area there that's all grown up now was the blacktop where, where the um, the cadets would march for parades at different times, uh, Easter vacations, and not vacations, but Easter holidays, um, Thanksgiving holidays, because we weren't allowed to go home. Uh, there would be parades and that over here. And, uh, we would have uh, the sponsors from St. Francis. The guys selected girls to act as sponsors for each company. and. Um, Sometimes on like Columbus Day, we would come over and we would play softball out here on the black top with the guys. Um, but this hill, I'll never forget it because it was like once you reached the top of the hill, we'd made it. That was a pretty good little walk from over at St. Francis to come over here and then have a little dance or whatever it was that we might would do after getting all sweaty and everything from the walk, <laughs> come over. Um, or the guys would walk over there, as I said, and we would have a, a, a dance generally in what we call the gym, the Quonset Hut is what the guys called it. A little tin facility over there. And uh, we'd sit, when the guys were going to come over for a dance, we would sit with one seat between us. All of the girls would sit in the gym in rows of seats and we'd have a, an empty seat on either side all the way around the room. When the guys marched in to the gym, they would march to an empty space and just stand there until the Eddies called, and then they would have a seat and we'd have a little socialization. Sometimes it was somebody that you know, sometimes it wasn't. It wasn't always your, your boyfriend or friend or whatever, it's just where they ended up in the march. going through your mind now? I was just thinking about it all. I think that, um, I think that it had everyone known 
or been taught the history of this property. I have the feeling that um, this wouldn't be what it is today. I believe that there would have been more of an earnest desire or actually working towards trying to save what many of us believe is ours, our heritage right here at this place. I don't think that it ever would have gotten to this. And that's why I believe that, that through the alumni now, that we, we're, we're gonna be able to uh, bring some life back to both these facilities. I honestly believe that. And that's as it should be. We're interested uh, through Book and Candle. We're, we had discussion in a board meeting not long ago that we want our children and our children's children to, to know about this and to become as involved and excited about it as we are. And I think they will. I know my, ch my well, at least my child, I have a daughter. Rhonda's 36 and she has never set foot on this property and, and just based upon the relationship that I've had with the people from St. Francis and St. Emma, the students, former students, and um, what she knows to be my feelings about this place, she has some I don't know how to explain it. It, it. It's almost as if you, you would think from speaking to her that, that she actually attended the school. But she has this really deep desire, um, first of all, to see the documentary done because she's done a great deal to try to help us as well. Um, and as I said, she's never set foot on this property. Never even been here. But she has this interest and this excitement about it. And I believe that that's the case where a lot of our children are concerned. It took a while to formulate ideas and plans in the creation of this project. And as a creative artist, I found it very difficult to find a starting point. And it just so happened that the slave cemetery here on this property became my focus. I found it natural to stand in their midst, that is the gravesite, and ask those souls where my path should begin. And it hit me. It wasn't just the story of the two schools. It was the story of the land. And once the land became the center of attention, everything started to happen. And it's been a glorious experience in uncovering certain artifacts. And surprisingly, great history. I'm also pleased to note that Without the help of the very wealthy, with the philanthropic organizations and personal family wealth, St. Francis and St. Emma would never have been created. Given the fact that this is a designated historical site that we're speaking of, it is also our wish that we may restore this particular piece of American history. Um, the mansion itself is in disre disrepair and it, it does need a helping hand. We had spoken with the Richmond Conventions and Visitors Bureau about the funding or monies that would help in the restoration. 
of the building. And it was told to us through them that monies would be accessible for that reconstruction if we opened the facility for visitors. Another reason why we felt it necessary to do a documentary or a docudrama about our lives here on these campuses was the fact that it would probably bring more of us to the fold. At present, we have approximately 1,300 people on our rolls, uh, our alumni roster, and yearly we come together in various parts of the United States for a rebirth or a rejuvenation of spirit. We come together in reunions. I remember my first reunion and it was, I was amazed at running into a boy who had been a senior who is now an adult who raised his own children and wife and life and job experience and now here we're standing together as grown men and I still somehow feel he's my upperclassman. And so does he. <laughs> and it's strange that even after all of these years, we, we are deemed as such. And these walks of life and these stations in life. And one of the big challenges was to overcome the upperclassman, underclassman syndrome. And it's happening. And there's networking, and there's friendships, and there are so many things that are developing from this, and it's such a nice feeling. It's such a great thing to experience. And in every one of us, there's something innate that speaks of these campuses, that makes us this one body. We have so much in common. Uh, we cared for one another. I was probably uh, the charge of an upperclassman. As being an upperclassman, I had other younger students in my charge. And their, their welfare um, was especially important. We, we had to look out for them. Um, we, we nurtured them. As children, we ourselves accept the responsibility in the growth and maturation of other students. And I think that in itself was something very special. And it's a pleasure to be a part of this large family of doers and creators. And it would be a travesty if this story doesn't have an opportunity to be told and told well. <laughs>